गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू आर एफ ओ एफ सेशन टूडे दि फोर्थ कमिंग एफ ओ एफ सेशन डेट्स आर ऑन स्क्रीन सो प्लीज टेक अ नोट आशीष भाई हेज इन्फॉर्म मी दैट ट्वेंटी थर्ड ऑफ मे इज अ बैंक हॉलिडे हव एवर मार्केट्स आर ऑन सो आई गेस आर एफ ओ एफ सेशन विल बी ऑन एंड वी बुक दिस वेन्यू सो दीज आर दी थ्री अपकमिंग डेट्स फॉर दी एफ ओ एफ let's uh, dive into our topic for the day uh, both terms look very very similar and in fact contain the same words family business and business family so it just the order is different uh, and again this is not technically a term which is used in academic textbooks and things like that this is uh, just something that is in a way my creation just to uh, think through things and just to clarify uh things in the minds of people again this is not necessarily for just very very large business owners it could be you own one grocery store and still a lot of things that are spoken about today which could apply to you uh and these things are timeless as we will see as we go along and why some thought needs to be given uh for people who have a business as part of their overall assets and even people like us who are minority shareholders in listed companies why some of these things are relevant to us as well so we'll look at things from both perspectives before we get into business people uh let's look at someone who's a salaried employee or a professional who gives labor or professional expertise in return for compensation to my mind life is quite simple for those people uh they are responsible for raising their children giving them a good education and a good start in life and if they have assets uh when they pass away or for the next generation all they have to do is take care of these things things like bank accounts mutual fund holdings jewelry which relatively is easy to value uh, they may have some things like vehicles epf all these things would be there and typically most people would have their primary residence they would own the primary residence again not too difficult to value sometimes there may be minor disputes both the kids if there are two kids both the kids may want the reset or the premise or both may want money if both want money it's easy sell off the home and distribute it equally uh if both want the house and there is some uh negotiation to be done one person agrees to take the money other person takes the house but this is as far as complications go it doesn't move beyond this too much business owners don't have it so easy people who have uh, a large business in their family uh, encounter numerous problems we'll look at those one by one so what if someone has 100 of net worth and 95 of that is a single asset which is the business that is there in the family and what are, what if there are two children three children four children or various other combinations so what happens in that case so this becomes challenging in the case of salaried person we saw that everything is either directly in the form of money or realizable in the form of money or worst case you can measure it clearly in terms of money here things may not be so easy again the challenge is that if there is one business and there are more than one inheritors the business itself may not be divisible what do you do then uh, the business may be a factory it may be a trademark it may have a valuable trademark so if you are of course this is a wrong example but i'm just giving it for the sake of giving it let us say you are the only maganlal chikki in lonavla 
these days there are too many but let us say there was only one maganlal chiki and you had three inheritors how do you defi- divide maganlal between the three of them right so uh, of course there are other examples so uh, let's say haldiram or various other brands are there which would be part of a family business Bik- uh, bikaji or whatever so uh, if there is one business and there are too many inheritors there is a challenge because you may not be able to easily divide those assets again the business may not be easy to value so let us say you are in a happy situation where you have one business and two inheritors but one person clearly wants the business the other person wants money which at least is some solution but then what is the value of that business is it 50 is it 100 is it 150 200 in many cases the value is in the eye of the beholder if it's a listed company at least you have some reference point in terms of what was the maximum high price that has been seen what is the lowest price that has been seen what is the current market price you have some reference point if it's a unlisted business if it's a private business you don't even have that reference point so how do you really value the business asset that is going to be passed on again money is not the only thing people aspire for if you are the ceo of a company you get public recognition you get to attend board, board meetings you get to address people in the annual meet you get invited for various industry events and things like that you are covered in the media various things are attached to it if uh someone gets the business and someone has only the money then there could be potential uh, cause for envy so this is again something that uh needs to be thought through needs to be planned in advance as to how to go about all of these things sometimes there may be a happy situation that the uh matriarch or patriarch may have worked in advance saying let me create two assets for two children that i have so let me buy two homes or let me create two lines of businesses and uh, i'll give one each but it's very rare to have two things which are exactly the same in terms of attractiveness or value so again that creates problems uh again so this is a question as old as our scriptures or mythology who eventually gets to run the business or should it be the most capable person who may not come from the family or should it be someone from the family within the family should it be the eldest should it be uh, defined on some quantitative parameter how does this go about again uh, if someone is a business owner does it mean that the next generation should be interested in business some people would be good sports persons would have aspirations to one win a gold medal medal for the country some people may be interested in dramatics some people may be interested in music or painting so why should the next generation compulsorily be in business which is again this is a practical situation which comes about uh often so uh two of our leading industry uh, people right now in the country so mr ratan tata and mr anand mahindra if you look at their uh, life journey so they had uh their education in is in different fields and their interests were in diverse areas so it's just accident that they eventually came back to business but they could have been in uh, different fields so again uh, from one of the prominent business families in india uh mr kumar mangalam birla's family there's someone who's a cricketer who was in the cricketing field uh, so again why should people necessarily be forced into entering the business or running a business and finally to solve problems you may create these two things you can make create a 
Hastinapur and you may create a Indra Prasad saying, let one kid get this, the other kid gets that. But anyone who's a parent here or who has siblings or who has younger people at home will know this. You buy two toys, exactly identical, same price, same features. One is red in color, one is blue in color. What will happen? Both will want either red or both will want blue. It never happens that one will say, okay, I'll take red. Other will say, I'll take blue. If you buy both blue, even then there is a problem. You then don't know which one is broken, which one is not. So they'll break one and then fight. The broken one is yours. So there is no easy solution, right? Again for this. Uh, this question has been debated uh, numerous times in academic li literature. There are various pros and cons. So there are different successful examples from each category, different failures from each category. Uh, and there is no clear answer. But nevertheless, we'll go through some of the models uh, that are out there. So let's start with this uh, point where... If you appoint professionals, it sounds great in theory. Uh, the business family owns stake in the business and they get annual profits. But someone who understands the business and who's a career professional is appointed to run the company. There may be conflicts of interest. The culture may be different. The incentives may be different. The uh, outside professional may have Empire building as a motive, whereas the business family may want a conservative approach, will uh, emphasize preservation over growth and various conflicts could happen. So this was again a famous example where Infosys hired a outside CEO and there was a culture mismatch and there were a lot of public fights and things like that and eventually they parted ways. And again, even if you appoint uh, family members, again, there's no easy solution. So, should Tritrastra have been given the uh, kingdom or should Pandu have been given the kingdom? Who knows what is the right answer? So one was blind and another one was frail. So, many a times, even in the business world today, you have... Uh, these kind of things and no matter how much the mediators try it's very very difficult to arrive at a consensus so again coming back to the three models one model is where the founders uh, of Infosys had decided that we will not get our children in the company uh, these days they have had a relook at that and uh, they are debating whether that was the right decision or not. For But for good or bad, none of their children are in business. Uh, one of the co-founders is a non-executive chairman, but otherwise everyone is outsider and it's professionally run. They still have shareholding in the business, but it's a independently run company. So this is one extreme where completely you have a professional management. You see all the independent directors and CEO are outsiders. This is what I would call the middle path, uh, Wipro, where they are significant shareholders as well as they have some executive role. So they two family members sit on the board and one of them is a executive chairperson, so has day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities at the company. But at the same time, there's a professional CEO and rest of the people are uh, professionally appointed in the company. This is the second example. Both of them are successful companies. So I, I am not passing any value judgment on any of the companies we are talking about. I am just giving you uh, different shades of family versus professional uh, management as it were. And this is the third example where Family is pretty much in the driving seat. So, 
uh, on the board you see the bajaj name repeated quite often uh, and there are outside uh, people also so you have neeraj bajaj rajiv bajaj sanjeev bajaj all of them uh, pretty much there as part of the board as i said I, no right or wrong answers each business each family will have to arrive at their own judgment and uh, governance framework as to how they go about uh, transitioning from generation to generation and uh, preserving and growing their capital again we come to a very very important point and uh, while we were having tea and snacks Uh, before the start of the presentation uh, i said that this topic will again come up uh, whether you should have a diversified portfolio or you should have a concentrated investment in one company so th on social media there was some interesting uh, thing that happened a uh, couple of months back so i don't know whether you guys got to see this so bill gates and warren buffett obviously are friends for a long time and bill gates as you know uh, stepped down from an active role at microsoft and started devoting his time more and more towards philanthropy so when he stepped off for the, from the active role he said why do i need to keep all my wealth in microsoft largely influenced by buffett he said let me have a diversified portfolio and the tweet goes like this after bill gates became friends with warren buffett he began to diversify his portfolio and sold microsoft shares bill gates fortune today is 138 billion dollars if he hadn't diversified it it would be 1.33 trillion dollars be careful with diversification and with friends who recommend it right so this was the uh, starting tweet and again someone smart weighed in on the tweet and had something to add on uh, this so nasim taleb responded to it he said double fooled by randomness diversification is not aimed at raising returns but lowering variance across possible histories what if microsoft went to zero cherry picking considering uh, consider the thousands of entrepreneurs who did not diversify hashtag #hindsight hashtag #imbecile okay so which one of this is correct uh, first one or second one we uh, consider that so let me come to the way i see it uh, what is it that we should look at i think concentration helps while you are getting rich uh, so if you are invested in a early stage company high growth company where your cost of shares is very very limited because either you were part of the co-founder or you were the early employees and uh, right now also it's not reached its potential growth rate is very very high probably some amount of concentration makes sense but for preservation of wealth concentration is never a good idea uh like in our city uh, at one point in time you had plenty of rich people uh, from the textile field for example all these mill owners now after the mill strikes and all the entire industry went down now i don't know their individual finances for each and every one of them but today they are not in the billionaires list let's put it that way uh would diversification have helped them preserve their wealth i would think so i would think that spreading risk across companies across industries would have helped rather than the entire fortune being linked to a single business or a single company so uh, 
yeah different people will have different approaches and uh, obviously even today a huge portion of uh, let's say uh, elon musk's fortune would be tied to tesla stock or uh, jeff bezos's wealth would be tied to amazon stock but uh, what bill gates did or what buffett uh, has written in his will that after his passing is widow should put all the money in an index fund not in berkshire stock uh, it's not that uh, she will be ha- hard pressed for money if she put money in berkshire stock but just as a matter of principle if you are not running it if you don't know what's going on if you are a no nothing investor from preservation point of view diversification makes a lot of sense don't go for concentration so again he said this many a times it's foolish to risk what you have and what you need for what you don't have and don't need so that's the point while becoming wealthy maybe you created an excellent company you were the founder you had maybe 70 80% stake in the company and you grew wealthy with the growth of the company but once it reached the stable stage then there is no additional benefit to hanging on to just one uh, company or one business this is especially true at the second or a third generation stage where uh, the people may or may not be motivated enough if people are motivated enough and are excited about getting up in the morning and going to work in that line of business wonderful but if you are like uh, let's say sharuk khan in chennai express where you don't like the mithai shop that uh, the previous generation is asking you to work in then if you are not excited about the business then better to exit it then don't uh, stick on to it or at least diversify at least keep part of the money in that one business and put uh, other money elsewhere as i said whether you employ professionals or whether you get your uh, family members to work in it it depends on circumstance to circumstance but be very clear if family is working in the business don't underpay them just because they are family members you can't exploit them and don't overpay them uh, let the ownership of the business be distinct from putting your efforts uh time and energy into that business both have both are different things ownership and effort both have to be rewarded differently again this is relevant if you continue owner owning the business and uh, even if there are professional managers involved and the family is just uh represented by board seats or voting power should an acquisition be made or not should you divest a business or not should you increase prices or go for uh market share when a, a new competition comes in all these are, there are no right or wrong answers so how do you resolve the inevitable conflicts that come about uh between family members and these are not even conflicts these could be differences of opinion and there would not be any right or wrong answer so some family constitution or some uh, family council or uh, advisor or some mechanism has to be there whereby these problems can get resolved as and when they come about and finally don't go for ye hamara khandani business hai ya this is how can i sell off my generational business and all that uh so a lot of people inherit these very very low roc businesses which were great businesses at one time but today they are terrible in the sense they don't even earn uh, the bank fixed deposit rate of return they would be earning maybe 5% on the uh, realizable value of the assets and things like that if either it's a low roc business or is it, it is a business uh with reputational or physical risks like uh if you are running a pesticide company and one accident could put you in jail or if 
it's a very leveraged business where you have given your personal guarantees so all these are clear no nos uh, or if it's a industry which is declining so no industry is uh, safe from obsolescence over very long periods of time so something like a kodak may be a very valuable business at one point in time where they were making photo film but to with digital cameras things go down or if uh in the early part of the last century uh industries like railroads were the hot industries today railroad owners are nowhere so today uh, maybe chip makers and internet companies are the hot things in the industry so uh if your industry is continuously going down in terms of pricing power in terms of volumes etc it's better to exit it rather than continue owning it in the family just for prestige sake or just for uh, reputa- reputation stake the other thing is uh, even if your absolute wealth is maintained by owning a declining industry you will keep losing your ranking as time goes by and newer and newer industries come in so uh, unless you are part of the uh listed business ecosystem where uh, the growing companies you have an opportunity to invest in them and uh, invest in the companies which are relevant today you may be fixed at a particular wealth level but you will see uh, everyone else uh, going beyond you so again that is another reason to uh, diversify away from just one business or just uh, one company i have spoken about this earlier so uh, again makes for a very interesting reading uh, house of uh, vanderbilt so essentially we don't want to be uh, in this position where within a generation or two uh, everything goes away we want to really uh, preserve wealth for the future generations and this typically comes we have discussed this uh, if people have too much spending or leverage or they are unmotivated or uh, people have too many or too few children all these problems can come about we have uh, discussed this in the past so i'll move on to the uh, topic for today so largely what every family business should aspire to is to move away from a family business to being a business family or a family office and reasoning is simple uh, initially there is no separation some people may start as sole proprietors and uh, there is not much difference between personal bank account and the business bank account and you work day in and day out uh, there is no work life balance business grows to a particular level but then there is a time to clearly start drawing the boundaries what is your business what is your family and while both want to exist in a symbiotic relationship it is not that if one thing goes down the other thing drowns with it uh, a business misfortune should not badly affect the family at the same time if at all there is some family turmoil the business should be able to live its own life and exist on its own so uh, this transition needs to happen and uh, the happy situation is that in india you are seeing a lot of uh, these things already happening and a lot of these things coming about so i'll discuss two aspects one is where the founders have sold the entire company and largely they have become a investment office or a family office and they are uh, doing it for the future generations that is one uh, sort set of examples and the other set of examples is the original business still exists in the family control but the in- incrementally dividends and cash flows from the business are used to create a separate set of investments and to create a separate family office so we have had various examples where the company was completely sold off and these days they largely run as a family office most of these are well known names and people would have uh, read about them or heard about them
and you have examples where the founders or the promoters are still owning the underlying business but incrementally they have started to create different structures from the dividend income that they get or from other resources that they have yeah so that's what i wanted to cover and rather than putting in too many slides uh, i thought it would be interesting to have a conversation and uh, if you have any comments or if you have questions i would be happy to discuss thanks yes rajiv bhai it's a very good presentation i think i have seen some changes way back some 15 years back 20 years back when some of the professionals from hindustan liver tried and joined soles or uh, rpg group that time rpg was alive and it became very difficult for them to survive there because the culture was completely different the canvas was too small then what they used to like nestle guy joining so always is resourceless completely because everything is handled by chavarias or even in rpg now things are changing slowly and suddenly so do you see uh, more and more family companies adopting hybrid model that's a very interesting point you make sir so uh probably i should have covered it in the presentation itself yeah yeah there are left leavers and join rpg and he was extremely extremely inept yeah so uh culture is culture fit is very very important and the longer the conversation that takes place before someone joins a board or a company uh the lesser the problems afterwards so if the detailed conversations do not happen earlier and people just jump into something then if uh, the culture fit is not there from day one then things become very very uh, challenging for a family business to professionalize uh, i don't think it can happen overnight it's a process which takes i would say many years and in some cases it can be a decade or more where gradually you build in uh, systems and processes you b- b- bring in the right people uh, you establish trust and then you are willing to let go and again partly it's a mindset thing so some people are unwilling to let go at all so uh, famously an indian business promoter of a large listed corporation uh was asked by a fii fund manager saying okay you are running it right now what will happen after you will you give it to your son or uh, will you get outside professionals or something meaning uh, why should it be only your son or so, some such uh, question was asked of him and his answer was mera beta nahi chalega to kya tera beta chalega company <laughs> Yeah, so culture fit is very very important and willingness to let go so uh thinking that this is my jagir and only me and my family can run it uh, that mindset can be challenging for outside professionals so especially if people have worked in multinational organizations uh, if they come into a family run company without that uh, mindset from the business owners then it becomes a nightmare for both parties involved yes please sir i have a question regarding the incentives that has to be framed uh for a professional uh, when i when let's say somebody is uh shifting from a family run business to a professionally run business uh often the conflict will happen is that maybe i would have done a better job 
because it's my business so the stakes are higher that is one and second is what how can i design the incentives in the right way such that he functions the way i expect him to do sure so uh, again lot of people in this room are fans of charlie munger and they, he kept saying throughout his life saying is underestimated the power of incentives despite knowing about that and he said show me the incentive and i'll show you the behavior uh in berkshire meeting notes or elsewhere they have discussed at length about how to incentivize people and how not to incentivize people so the key thing is incentivize people uh on things that they can can control and do not incentivize things on things that are beyond their control so in an uh, oil exploration company or in a primary oil producer if you incentivize based on profits the crude price will go up from 10 dollars to 150 dollars and profits will go all over the place and people will either get a huge bonus or will not get anything depending on completely external factors again incentivize people on what is good for the long term well being on the company rather than short term goals so they have given examples of gaiko where if you increase ad spend it will actually lower the profit in the first year but the lifetime value for the business is positive so then incentivize people accordingly where you uh, incentivize for longer term uh, performance and longer term uh, business value creation so uh, the parameters will vary from company to company also it should not be such that it encourages people to game the system where if you are monitoring one or two parameters let us say if you are uh, monitoring only customer additions then people may put in fake customer ids and things like that so uh, try and ensure that things are not gamed but otherwise as long as you have a fair incentive system for outside professionals i think people will do a good job if they are respected if they are trusted and uh, if they if they have a fair incentive scheme in place thank you rajiv for a very nice presentation very thoughtful and i think uh, at least from my point of view it is very relevant for investing also because uh, what goes on in a family affects lot of in, you know listed companies and you have given some examples of infosys and wipro but we have seen lot of mergers and demergers happening because of that so maybe you know request a follow up presentation on how such things have triggered some uh, corporate actions because of this could be very relevant for us another thing i just wanted to point out is um, that you know i'm sure not only small businesses but big companies are facing this issue of obsolescence as you mentioned but very often that could be due to uh, narrowly defining a business so there is a famous harvard case study called what business are you in so where you know though they talk about the railroads getting obsolete obsolete uh, obsolete yeah obsolete because you define your business as running trains if if the same companies had defined their business as logistics and they could, would have evolved with the technology and you know got into areas because they under they their customers anyway needed transportation of car cargo similarly there's an example of like newspaper you know they are getting obsolete because of mainly in us because the cost of delivery became very expensive you know manpower cost went up and door to door delivery and then you had internet so the need for customers to get in news and information did not change only the way to deliver it changed so companies which narrowly defined their business as just delivering paper newspaper uh they got wiped out so that's relevant uh, more and more now because there's so many technological innovation ai is coming etc and uh, you know competition from large internet uh businesses like amazon you know it will affect a lot of family businesses so and even listed companies i see 
they still a lot of them narrowly define their business and they just get wiped out after a few years so that's a very relevant thing to look at thank you sure thanks uh thanks rajiv for the presentation i just had one question how would you differentiate between a good family office versus a so so family office any thoughts a lot of them are getting into it either for fashion or either for saving on manager cost or things like that the uh real purpose should be to preserve and preserve wealth first grow it at reasonable rates for the longer term and do it consistently uh firstly uh it's very important to not fool yourself so it said that the easiest person to fool is yourself uh, and in the family office spectrum you have the good bad and ugly or the entire spectrum is there uh, some of the family offices i have interacted with are so much into market timing we'll enter this and exit then uh, buy this uh, do this interest rate bet do this commodity bet uh, predict the outcome of elections and what not uh, and the way i have seen them buying and selling uh, they would have been better off just putting money in an index fund uh, rather than do anything else some are too much enamored by this whole startup thing so i am not saying startups are good or bad there are good startup opportunities and there are bad startup opportunities but some of them are in it just for the kick of it just for uh getting their name in the media that these people funded this or to talk about things in the party circuit where uh, it's a very flippant kind of approach so uh whereas uh so uh let me put it this way some people have created family offices without actually having created anything of value in terms of uh having a good listed company or having created a valuable business they are just in it for Uh, names it whereas people who have done serious business who understand the marketing challenges hr challenges production challenges uh people who have a lot of gray in their hair they are doing a far more serious job and a better job in this rather than people who are who have a fancy mba degree and who have just read a few uh, papers and who are in it Uh, Rajiv, if I can ask, it's a very gender biased, socio cultural question. But in your experience, if you've seen now, what are you finding? Is finding a paradigm shift in families who have daughters who may be capable to take on the business, but do you find a shift that they are willing to put their confidence in that, or they would rather give it out again? Uh, the sad part is progress is not as much as it should be. Uh. in the media recently in one of the south based business families uh, the daughter had to sue uh, and pick up a fight saying why are daughters not allowed on the board and uh, things like that uh, things are easier where the parents have just daughters where you have plenty of examples uh, but otherwise patriarchy remains to a large extent uh, things are changing but not as fast as i would like them to change so you know just a thought came to me i have faced such situation uh, so one example for example is the hinduja venture situation which is you know a co- listed company which has um, shareholders who should be treated as partners so it sells its business and gets lots of cash after that you know the promoter can actually run it as a family office and do something with that money and create wealth for everybody but it's sad to see that most of them are busy taking out money from the company somehow and you know leave the shareholders high and dry so any comment on that 
I think I don't know about the company, and again, it's not really a family. It's more of a governance question rather yeah. than yeah. Yes, yeah. so uh, there are a lot of companies who sell their main business, and only cash is left in the company. Plenty of examples are there, and later yeah. on, some of them went on in a different line of business. So, like me, cosmetics business was sold, and then it became Trent or Piramal Enterprises, the pharma, the generic business was sold. Some cash was returned to shareholders. Other money went into uh, creating new lines of businesses. So there are plenty of examples where such things are. Yes. So Rajiv, why I I just wanted to know. See earlier uh, after Rahul Bajaj, Sanjeev and Rajiv came. Then after Dhirubhai, Mukesh Bai and Anil Bai came. That way Mariwada also, uh, you know, one son came into the business, the other way went into auto anger. Thing like that, but you know, you know beforehand that those those two, their hair appearance are going to run the business, but they are groomed. Even in Birlas, you know, Aditya Birla was groomed. Then Umar Mangalam was groomed. Now, if you see, exa- for example, Reliance or any such companies, you don't actually have a confidence. Or you don't hear anything that their second line has a team of their own. It is still run by, although they are taken on the board and everything, but there still it is run by, say, Manoj Modi or somebody is somewhere let's there. Let's not get into each company specific no, thing. So there would be so what, various models, various varieties, and again, we don't know how the internal uh, functioning works in various companies. But is there a, is what I am trying to ask is is there a change of family thinking that they uh, the younger generation need not slog before coming to a board? Uh, so two things are happening in my view. One is that the younger generation is far better educated than what the previous generation were. So most people have business management and have done uh, some. Uh, good graduation either in engineering or in some other subjects. Uh, the downside I think is there is somewhat of a fast uh, career progression. So they are probably not spending enough time on the shop floor uh, to understand the nuts and bolts of the organization. So that could be a downside. So good part is better education. Second part is they are reaching the board level very very fast. That should be a bit slower, in my opinion. This is again, there would be exceptions to this, and uh, there would be a whole variety of career progressions. But yeah, Okay, so there is a question that family office ecosystem is growing, but the advisory ecosystem is not growing. So I presume that here uh, the question is pertaining to the investment advisors as registered with SEBI versus the uh, uh, distributors who get paid a commission. Uh, Yeah, which is true. The data is clear that there are far more number of distributors which are there as compared to uh, the advisors. Now, uh, at the top, very, very wealthy people are employing their own people to do their research and to do their asset allocation and planning uh, of all sorts, whether it's uh, tax planning or uh, cross-border or insurance or whatnot. Uh, once Once we exclude the billionaires and once we come to the middle market, Uh, Over there, I think partly it's the fault of the clients and individuals who are willing to buy commission products but are not willing to write out an advisory check. So everyone wants everything free, which is one problem which is uh, restricting the growth of advisors. And the other problem is, to some extent, uh, there is a far more... uh, a far greater regulatory burden on the advisors in terms of uh, 
keeping themselves ready for audit and taking a lot of prior approvals and things like that. So I think the second part will get addressed somewhere or the other. A lot of consultations happen with the regulator and somewhere those things would get fixed. Uh, but this uh, basic issue where as long as I don't know I'm being charged something indirectly, uh, I just go in and buy a product. But the moment I'm told that I have to pay uh, maybe 25,000 rupees as fee for consultation, then I would balk at that. I would say, oh, this is too much of money to pay and I would rather do a Google search and try and figure out what I should be doing. So uh, doctors face this problem, self-medication and uh, Dr. Google and uh, investment advisors also have this issue. Uh, hi, sir. Hi. So I had a suggestion and a question. The suggestion was if we ever do a follow-up session, I would like to see examples of certain inflection points wherein, say, a good business started doing after a change of management and maybe like an average business started doing very well after a change of management. And my question was on the startup space. So wherein, what is your view on the startup founders, the way they keep raising funds and probably lose control of their own company? and probably even lose the voting rights and the control as on the decisions. So how do they end up, you know, keeping it their own baby and also seeing the success being run by other professional investors who have joined the board? To my mind, there are two kinds of startup founders. Uh, one segment is interested in creating something valuable. They are so driven by passion that... Uh, Every additional share that a minority shareholder or an outside investor wants, they have to snatch it away from the founder. The founders are extremely stringy when it uh, stingy when it comes to giving up voting rights. You look at someone like a Mark Zuckerberg or the Google founders. Whereas the other set of founders from day one, they are focused on a higher and higher valuation round and creating their family offices on the side. So, how do I keep encashing it? And uh, the famous Ashneer Grover in his book has written that among some of them, they had a thing that at each funding round, they have to buy a big luxury car, right. which is a very distinct approach from people who start a business in the garage who are bootstrapping and very frugal and focused on the growing the business, they will not raise a funding round unless it is absolutely necessary. They will worry more about the product than uh, about blowing up cash and marketing spend. They will want to acquire customers fast but usually organically and things like that. So yeah, you have all kinds of examples. My question came, came from actually Shark Tank only. When we see most of the sharks that are sitting there, almost all of them don't even own more than 10% of their own business right now. Shark Tank is uh, partly business, but largely for entertainment, right? If you make it too serious, then you don't get TRPs. Right? The actual way things get funded is much more serious, meaning it's not that you go and uh, within a short pitch, you either get a... Yes or no, there's a lot of due diligence back and forth. And Shark Tank is for entertainment. Thanks for the uh, Just a thought. You think some regulation around uh, uh, how the composition of board should be for listed entities where majority should be non-relative, non-promoter, where there could be some definition of what uh, defines a relative at least that will help address you know uh, or align the interest of the family owning majority vis-a-vis -vis the shareholders uh, you think this this is a feasible or a, as a option that could be uh, put forth I don't think this uh, question has had a satisfactory answer anywhere in the world so even in the west so again Buffett and Munger have spoken about this at length as if uh, the independent directors don't have sufficient stake in the business, if they are getting paid very, very handsomely for their board seat, 
and it forms a substantial portion of their income and how can you expect them to be independent if you raise uncomfortable questions at one board meeting word will go around that this fellow is a difficult director you will not get other board seats whereas if you are seen as a compliant person you will be invited to all boards and be paid very very handsomely so uh, i don't think regulation by itself can do much but as outside shareholders probably we can look at the board composition and decide whether it's a good board or not a good board but i don't think that uh, answer is clear to me or to anyone else and in fact buffett has berated himself saying i was not as tough as i should have been because in a social circumstance people who uh, you know socially and all uh, it's not a given thing to just ask too many tough questions you may ask one or two but then you have eaten up your quota then you can't ask a third one probably so yes please thank you sir for a good presentation i think a few years back you had a similar presentation on this if i can remember correctly the thing is uh, family businesses when they want to expand they bring in a p investor now when you bring in a p investor just like we want to make long term capital gains on every stock they also want to make a long term capital gain on that from that company and move away so generally they tell the business owners that you bring in a professional ceo or and a cfo who can uh, run the business and since you have developed the business to this level you take a probably take a back seat now some companies some business owners give them a free hand some don't if they don't get a free hand the ceos leave in a couple of years and all so what should be the uh, balance another thing like recently we have if you have of course you must be following the bajus where the business owners had a complete control and the p firms are in a mess so i wanted some comments on that sure so recently in our uh, research group we had a interesting example of a company where the founders sold the company to a pe group and then the value got destroyed and the founders have repurchased the company from the pe group so you have uh, all sorts of examples uh, so pe most of the pe Uh, world as it operates is uh, typically they get into a unlevered business. They use some leverage to pay out them, uh, pay some cash out to themselves at an early stage. Whatever unexplored levers are there, uh, increase pricing, cut advertising, sack a few workers, sell off some assets, and they want to earn a. Go- I'm not saying each and every one is like that, but. at least some or majority seem to be like that where they are not very very short term oriented in terms of intraday trading or 3 months 6 months but their thing is to make things look very very good in a 4 5 6 year time horizon and then either do a public listing or to sell it to someone else and take their money and go away you are right in that sense so uh for people who care about the business you showed sell to someone who has a perpetual owner mindset or a long term mindset it could be a strategic investor who may be a competitor in the industry or someone who likes the business or maybe have a listing and uh, sell the business if you sell to pe funds with a short term maturity cycle then what you are describing is what is very likely to happen great thank you so much thanks a lot one of the things got rough i always remember what my father used to say running a business does test a man my son there are ups and downs glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated 
the character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes. But when the chips are down, we must stand up, dust ourselves off, and motor on. Volatility. It's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, there are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way. At PPFAS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business. And buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term. PPFAS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.